growing green to generate more green. Welcome to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman. Each week, we plant the conversational seeds about cultivation and the changing climate of cannabis culture. We'll peel back the layers of benefits of the world's most versatile plant, from food to fuel, from remedy to resource. CannabisRadio.com proudly presents The Grow Show with your host, multi-award-winning grow master and respected cannabis consultant, Kyle Cushman. Hello and welcome all you fans of the Gondolicious Goodness, Mellow Mary Jane, and Unbridled Individuality. This is The Grow Show on CannabisRadio.com and I am your host, Kyle Cushman. Today we are talking to a colleague of mine whose roots are well established in the cannabis cultivation community. He and I go way back, speaking on numerous expert panels together. Through a multitude of high times, normal, and various cannabis culture events over the years, our paths are always crossing. His biography is simply remarkable. Adam Dunn is the founder and head breeder at TH Seeds, one of the world's oldest seed banks, with locations in both Amsterdam and Denver. They've practiced their creed to protect genetics and serve mankind since 1993. This has led to him being a multi-cup winning cultivator notable for strains such as Bubblegum, Sage, MK Ultra, Cold Creek Kush, Dark Star, and many other cup winning varieties. And his contribution to the cannabis cause doesn't stop there. Also in 1993, Adam Dunn formed the company CIA Cannabis in Amsterdam. CIA became a driving force in Amsterdam for cannabis education and a meeting spot for cultivators and researchers of the plant. He's also co-founder of the Hoodlum Clothing Company, a professor at Cloverleaf University in Denver, and hosts the weekly podcast, The Adam Dunn Show. He's respected, talented, influential, and obviously very busy. And I'm happy to welcome Adam Dunn to The Grow Show. Thanks so much for being on the show today, Adam. Thank you very much, Kyle. That was a great intro. I have to get a copy of that one. That's <laughs> better research than I've ever done. It was one of the longer biographies, but I really wanted to do you justice. You know, you've been involved in this industry for so long. You know, yeah, in so. fact, for two decades, you lived away from your native country, living your life as an expatriate and sacrificing pretty much home and everything because the medical plant that you love and also changes lives just so happens to be illegal under United States law. And those so, times are changing, that's for sure. Well, you know? during the time, you know, you did some pretty amazing things like founding the world's most respected seed bank and cultivating world-class cannabis. I want to know, although it might seem obvious, I want to know in your words, what brought you to Amsterdam originally and why did you stay so long? Well, you know, that's a, <laughs> that is a long question. So I, I know you want short answers, but I'll try to keep it short. I moved there when I was 19, so I was at that perfect age where, you know, to appreciate getting out of America at 19 because you're not 21 yet and you're not able to do anything back home. So to be able to go to a country where you could, you know, go out at 16 and, and already be there. So I ended up moving there mostly for the fact that I had one or two good contacts there and they were just, you know, really good people that had also expats that had moved there. And, you know, they were there for completely different reasons. They weren't there for cannabis at all. They were actually there for the gay rights that are, were sort of prevalent in Holland at that time. So they moved over there and I had this one great contact and she basically let me stay in her house. And I, as a 19 year old, I was kind of counting my, looking at the, the obvious future I had. And I thought, you know, of all places I've been in the world, this is probably the one that I, I felt most comfortable in a short amount of time. Hmm. As you know, being been there so many times, it was like, you know, the, it was the simplest things in life that made it good. I got away from, I was trying to get away from America with, with cars and payments and things like that. And I was just like the beauty of riding a bicycle through town and being able to smell cannabis freely and stuff. It was just like the simplest things, you know what I mean? And that was all I cared about. Exactly. And I'm sure that those years have helped shape your actual personality. Yeah. You know, it was pre-internet too. So I think, you know, back in the day, it was like, you know, that was when you had to go to someplace to see it. You couldn't go on Google Earth, you know what I mean? You couldn't, you couldn't just experience everything you think. Because now people go to Amsterdam and they've already virtually been into every shop, you know what I mean? And now it's uh, back back in the day, it was like I had to call my friend up who actually lives here in California and, and tell him, you know, it's it's real, dude. There's really places you can go and buy <laughs> cannabis. And so I was still in that zone where it wasn't even 100% sure if this was a fantasy or, or not, you know? So uh, yeah. again, it, it may be an obvious question, but I, I want to hear it in your words. What is it specifically that you could do in Amsterdam that you couldn't do in the U.S.? And what has changed? Well, you know, the thing is, that, uh, when I first moved there, it was uh, a little bit different than it is now. The rules were, and I was trying to get my head around it when I first got there, they said you could have up to 50 plants. 
plant personally. So I was like, wow, 50 plants. You know, there's so much you can do with 50 plants. <laughs> and, you know, the way that the laws are now coming down to most places saying six or, or something along those lines, you know, it was like the idea of having 50 plants and being able to, to do what you wanted to do. And I, at that time, didn't have a lot of experience growing. I'd grown a few plants in Florida when I lived there outdoors and, you know, just kind of was more into the idea of being able to finally expand a little on the, on the idea of growing. And I ended up learning in the place that I thought I was going to be the mecca of cannabis. And it was the mecca of cannabis, but it seemed like there was a lot of learning still to be done there. You know, like Amsterdam was far ahead of the rest of the world, but at the same time, kind of behind in the American way of smoking cannabis. Like people there mixed with tobacco, first of all. So that was my first learning curve was, huh. You guys don't really smoke as much as you think. We think you smoke. You know what I mean? <laughs> and to be an American over well, there long term, it really it, made it kind of like where I had a little bit of an advantage, I think, just because I didn't mix tobacco with my cannabis. And I think that really made it easier to, to fall into this whole breeding thing. Really? Interesting. What is it that prompted you to make the decision to come back to the States? You know, like I came back in 2009 to the uh, THC Expo that was going on here at the Convention Center where I'm at today. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that this industry is about to expand and become the animal that we always wished it was, which is, you know, Amsterdam is a very small place. It's a little village, basically. And all the international attention that it always got for cannabis didn't really know how to deal with it sometimes. And I think that California and America wants and needs cannabis so much that when I came back and saw how happy it made people here, even more happy than they were in Amsterdam, to have it on their own home soil, I kind of felt like this might be the, the new place. And also, I believe that in my true, my heart, I believe that America screwed this up, so they needed to fix it. You know? <laughs> That's like I needed to be, I, and I felt like I needed to be part of that. You know? That's a great way to put it. And so yeah. you're putting down roots back in the U.S. now. Oh, yeah. And I've been here for now five years. It's going very fast, as you noticed. I mean, we're at all sorts of business meetings and congresses and everything is going at a rapid pace. And I'm really glad that I made the move because I think the people in Amsterdam are really feeling left out right now in this whole international cannabis sort of revival because as the world goes up, they go down. You know, that's terrible. Well, it's terrible well they, don't, they don't have the economic engine that we do. But, you know, it's really important in my eyes that people like you and I and peers of ours – we claim some of this real estate, both financial and ideological, and that we claim sure. this real estate before somebody else does, and then they get to paint it in their vision, because our vision yeah. is much more altruistic. True. And I mean, the, the generations come to rapidly, too. Like, whereas, you know, 10 years ago, that kid that was your friend's nephew or whatever is now at the age, you know what I mean, where he can actually make a difference, and he's seen maybe you know, the struggles that have happened before, like we're talking about multi-generational families that have been growing cannabis in California for years, and now they have to make a quick decision whether to jump into this, the legal side, or to stay on the underground, which is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller, you know? Yes. As you know. And as you know, cannabis legalization has been making great leaps forward in the past few years. 20 plus states have seen actual legalization and many more are seeing legalization initiatives that have a strong majority of public support. And how do you see legalization at the state and federal level shaking out over the coming years? You know, it's very much economic based, obviously. I think as states come on board, California being the one that's going to really change the way people think because California's always been synonymous with cannabis. I mean, it's always been the thing that the, the mecca of cannabis. That's why um, I'm here. The fact that, you know, NorCal is now suffering from drought and fires and we're looking at El Nino kicking in this year harder than ever. 30 years of growth that are getting burned up in, you know, in days. And it's looking like they might be a major shift in the way people conceive of indoor and outdoor cannabis. You know, the, the idea that outdoor is king is, is true on the weight level and on the fact that you can produce so much and such, you know, for lower cost. But when you're dealing with Mother Nature and things like this, the economic side might become the one that challenges everybody more than, than they think. You know what I mean? They, they really have to look at it from a long-term point of view because things can change in one season, as you see with hundreds of thousands of acres of fire and all that. I mean, this is going to be a barbecue this year. I, I fear for the, yeah. uh, for the expects that come out of NorCal this year, how they're going to be received, you know, because that stuff doesn't come out. Smoke is a bitch. Let me tell yeah. You. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I lived you know. up there in Northern Cali and it is a, it's a beautiful place to live. It's a bad year here in California. 
Well, you know, the thing, I think they've had such good years. They've had, like, the last couple of years have been so good with the drought. A good thing for cannabis, when you have a drought situation, it means everything's ideal as far as there's no mold growing, that's for sure, you know? So now that they've got affected with this heavy year this year, I, I, it's going to be a very, very, very interesting dynamic. It is. Well, we've been having a very interesting conversation, but it's time for a smoke break. So hang on, you tenacious tokers, because we'll be right back with more from our guest, Adam Dunn of TH Seeds. The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman will return once we cultivate through this short commercial break. Dr. Dabber, hurry! Its temperature is shooting past 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's burning up! I'm afraid for this little guy, it's just too late. What caused the problem? Only Dr. Dabber can maintain the perfect temperature for a smooth-tasting, slower burn. This standard vaporizer lost all of its health benefits, sending it up in smoke. So you're telling me that most vapor pens burn so hot they produce smoke, not vapor? Correct! Keep away from those standard vaporizer pens and turn to Dr. Dabber, doctor's order. Less heat, <laughs> More flavor. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. Doc Rob, the concierge for better living. Cannabis is just one of the many great plants that we have on this planet called Earth that we can use consciously and, and intelligently to improve our well-being. Take a real, raw, inside look at healthier living while sharing great ideas and improvements for a better quality of life. Learning to live and live well is a lifelong process. This is a journey. It could be you could be 80 years old or eight years old. You can still learn something that's gonna make tomorrow a little bit healthier, a little bit easier, a little bit happier, a little bit better. The concierge for better living with Doc Rob. Only on cannabisradio.com. Time to plant some more conversational seeds. You're listening to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman, only on CannabisRadio.com. Hello and welcome back, everyone, to The Grow Show. We're talking here with Adam Dunn of TH Seeds. You know, this is the first guest that I've had on to talk about breeding. Nice. I've tried to reach Scott Reach of Rare Dankness, and, you know, he's really busy now with his huge building that he's building out in Colorado there. Yeah, and yeah. We're really happy for him about that. But let's move on to the work you're doing with cannabis breeding and preservation. Okay. What's the most treasured possession in the vaults of TH Seeds? Well, you know, I, and I have to say, I've pretty much my same answer for the last 20-plus years. When we developed Sage back in the day, it was from a Central California haze strain that was kind of as far as hazes go, was I wouldn't say unknown, but it was definitely one of the least known. And it was a Zacatas uh, Mexican purple that still had that hazy background. And the thing about it, it was a great yielding haze, which doesn't always happen. And we kind of championed that plant for Amsterdam for 20 plus years. And I brought it all back here and have used it in multiple crosses. It's kind of one of those plants where it adds something special to everything it touches. And it, and it really has a unique vibe. It's got that sandalwood kind of background that gets everybody who's in the, if you're a real like seasoned smoker, I believe that haze is what you want. You know what I mean? Because absolutely cushions and things are great as a daily, but when it comes to like long-term, like if you're going to smoke the same strain for 20 years, you got to pick something that is unique, you know, and, and it was unique with Kush back in the day when like I first brought it back out to Amsterdam, I brought Kush and, and sour diesel back in around 99 to Amsterdam. And, and that's when it was unique, you know what I mean? Nobody had ever seen that. But now it's like everybody has their own cushion. and everybody has a sour, you know. But the haze is because they take long to grow. A lot of people don't want to do it, you know. And that's, to me, the most important, like, long-term thing that I'll have, you know. Well, my favorite collection. strain, of course, as you know, for over two decades has been the strawberry cough, and that's right. very hazy. I actually grew your sage once from some seeds that you personally handed me at my home up in Mendocino. Oh, yeah, I remember. I literally no exaggeration, grew the highest yielding plants I'd ever grown indoors to this day. Yeah. I that's, think I remember that. I remember that crop, actually. I remember you telling me about it, yeah. And that's the thing I love about that plant is it's, it's haze, but it produces weight, you know what I mean? And that's something that is kind of hard to ever... Everybody always wants the same thing. They want something that's super fast. You know, it's got all these things that you'll never get in the conditions that you're trying to achieve, you know? You can't do it in that time frame. But with the haze, you get that 
explosive growth around the eighth week, you know, flower, which is when usually everything's petering off on you. And that's a really great feeling. Not to mention the really great feeling you get when you imbibe the haze strains. Pretty much everything I've ever written, I've written on some form of haze. Yeah, <laughs> so. that's a, and that's true. I mean, I had so many people who have told me, like DJs and band members and writers, that sage in particular is their, like, go-to plant. Like, I had guys who were writers back in Amsterdam, and, and they would, if they couldn't get haze, sage, they were just like literally in like writer's block for, for days, you know what I mean? And then they'd get that and it would grease the wheels and send them off into their creative sort of spectrum where they would, you know, develop some awesome stuff. And it was great. Like one of these guys was a motivational speaker. So I'd have somebody who tell me that they're a motivational speaker. They go in front of thousands <laughs> of people, but they awesome. have to have Sage to write their stuff. You know what I mean? So I was like, awesome. okay, I love to hear that. So I know there's yeah. a really cool acronym for the Sage, but I forget it. Please tell us what it is. It is a sativa Afghanica genetic equilibrium. Mm-hmm. And the, the Afghanica part of it is interesting because Rob Clark, he had not published that word as a sort of description yet, but there was a few people who were trying to recall, because you know, the, the, I'm sure you, you and your listeners are familiar with the whole Rob Clark sativa indica. Sort of I was going to get, I was going to get to that question. <laughs> okay. Well, that part of that was the Afghanica was a classification that hadn't really been put out there yet because we had sativa, we had, Ruderalis, we had Indica, but he kind of decided, well, not decided, but he had actually, through the research, said, like, oh, Afghanica needs its own category. And by us publishing Afghanica Equilibrium as a agricultural product, we kind of, like, cock-blocked this other botanist who was about to publish his, his writings and use Afghanica as title and put his name next to the Afghanica. So he was just Hey, but that's it. okay. Rob Clark, he can decide what to call things. He has that much exactly. credibility. Exactly. And somebody has to decide. It might as well be somebody like Rob Clark. Right. So, so I guess we just championed the name and, and ended up getting that guy and Rob and all sorts of... Well, Rob didn't mind, but the other guy was very heated over it. And so apparently, yeah, we ruined him. So... Not a bad thing. Oh, you know. Anything to help out Rob, you know. Shit happens, as they say. Mm -hmm. I don't know the other guy. Unfortunately, Rob's a wonderful man. No, neither. No, no. We may never know. We may never know. The world will never know. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, this might be a tough question, or it might be really simple. I don't know. What are the three most important factors in breeding cannabis? Well, the obvious would be that you have stable genetics to begin with, you know. When you have a multi-poly hybrid from people who like haven't who weren't breeding in the first place. It was just a mistake. Because usually, I mean, you got to imagine that most of the cannabis that has been grown over the years, and most of the best cannabis has literally been bag seed because that's the plant expressing itself to keep going. You know what I mean? And, and a really good plant will always throw a few male flowers out at the very last weeks or so, you know, and especially like sage, for instance, it, you know, like the 10th week of flower, when it's a really peak fluorescence, it'll throw one or two male flowers out. So those plants tend to occasionally throw one or two beans. That's what sour diesel was. That's what OG Kush was. They were all mistakes, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. so the fact that you have something, um, you know, the idea of stability is something that you grow and you don't get surprised by it. You know, it doesn't throw Hermes flowers on you. It, it doesn't react weird, especially like, you know, I tell people like light sensitivity is really important. You know, if you walk into a room and your plants throw out male flowers in one second of showing them, then they're probably not very good genetics to be working with. Sure. In the future. They're going to express some craziness when the lights go out one day or something. So whereas you get a rock solid plant that you open the doors, but you're not supposed to and show your friends. So like stability, so stability then isn't yeah. really just, we're not just talking about, you know, stability in the actual strain and the breeding. We're talking about stability to stresses as well. Mostly, yeah, because that's the only, I mean, you got to imagine, like, in the beginning, like, we, we don't have, you don't have much to work with. Somebody hands you a bean, you grow that bean, and you learn it from the inside out after maybe three or four cycles, you might really have that thing dialed up. And then part of that dialing it up is deciding whether or not it's, it's, it's a fun plant to work with. And if it's the kind of plant where it's, you know, very hard to trust the plant, you know what I mean? If you know that, oh, I opened the door, it might throw a nanner on me, then those are the ones you don't really want to work with. And it's, it's very true with feminized strains. Like a lot of people are going for feminized, but the, what they don't understand is that the reason that those plants are feminized in the first place is that they reacted to stress in a way like by converting them, like, like transferring to, to a, from a male to a, or from a female to a male. That's showing me weakness in a sense in the genetic. So what are your next one or two important factors? Um, and I would say the male selection is probably your other major factor, probably equal on par with stability because the male is half of the information that's going to be passed on to your prodigy. So the idea is that 
you know, if you have a great female, like everybody knows their females really well, they have a great, you know, sour diesel or OG or uh, granddaddy perps or something that they feel really comfortable with and they want to cross into it. Now the male, obviously, you can't just go willy-nilly and grab any old male because that is literally have your information. So finding a good male that, again, stability of the male is important too. You want it to, so like, that but it's important that... because that really changes your company. Like, for instance, Soma uses that G13 Hayes male, right? And so does DNA, and so does another couple of companies. So my idea was that I never use that G13 mail because I didn't want to be like any of the other seed companies in Amsterdam. I wanted to stay unique. So I always used my own mails that I selected and that I knew nobody else had. And that made me feel like, okay, I have something special regardless. Individuality, of I praise it, absolutely. So, so yeah. But that begs the question, so choosing, you know, females are easy because we can smoke yeah. them, we can taste them. Sure. How do you choose a male? Um, there's a few things that you want to go with. Obviously, tactile things like smell and texture and, and how the plant mm-hmm. even produces any trichomes, with visible trichomes. Do you, do you ever smoke a male? Well, we can reverse a male is one way to, if you really want to test stuff, you can reverse the male, turn it into a female, and then smoke that female, and then really get an idea. That's that's actually the only reason I like feminizing stuff. I think that's a great technique for figuring out the males because, you know, since we're not smoking the males normally, if you can do that, you actually get all the uh, bells and whistles. But the other real key is not to go for the early flowering males because you're really going for the later flowering males. Early flowering males, just like in the human world, are not desirable by females. (laughs) So you need to go for the one that can handle it a little longer, come on a little later, because those will tend to produce more and actually be more like a better structured plant, you know? And of course you have CBD testing and THC testing now, which is, you know, much more scientific and it can actually help but it can also hinder if you rely on it because if you rely on it you'll end up growing a bunch of swag that nobody wants to smoke because the paper said it works good you know what i mean where you really want to go on people's opinions not numbers really good important stuff before we get to the end uh really quickly because we are about out of time can you tell us a little about what else you've got in the works Sure. You know, I'm still doing hoodlum clothing, of course, and so we're based out of, and in Colorado is a perfect environment for that. So, so the hoodlum clothing is still rolling strong. And as far as THC, I'm partnering up with the guys from Dark Horse Genetics. We're going to do some collaborations, some greenhouse facility in Pueblo. So we're going to be doing some greenhouse growing down there, working with an extract company called AU Extracts in Colorado, and we're going to develop some stuff together, some new strains. One of the things about growing for extract is a little bit different than growing for cannabis. I mean, really dense buds don't necessarily work out so well when you're trying to load columns, you know what I mean? So sometimes a different technique or a different style of plant works better in those different situations. And, you know, it can change the game. That's awesome, Adam. And I look forward to coming out and visiting you again real soon. We are coming to the end of our second segment. So we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. And then we're going to come right back with Ask Kyle. The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman will return once we cultivate through this short commercial break. Your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis plans for owners just like you to insure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R spells out their full-service insurance services, ranging from commercial to bonds, to personal, from life to health, and more. Contact the team at KarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. MJWellness.com, the largest medical marijuana community in the world. Connect with thousands of patients, doctors, industry leaders, and businesses through shared personal experiences along our worldwide network. Discover new therapies and benefits with content tailored to you. Come grow your network on mjwellness.com. You're not alone. Your wellness matters. Learn, live, and thrive. Check out mjwellness.com today. Cannabis Confidential with Dr. Dina. Candid. I want to give you the inside story. Captivating. I want to introduce you to my kind and amazingly talented friends. Compelling. 
we get to meet some of the most amazing cannabis activists and warriors around. Listen in as medical marijuana pioneer, Dr. Dina shares never before heard stories, chats with cannabis insiders and celebrity friends, and provides invaluable perspective and insight into one of the fastest growing industries in the world. I want to share with you what was once confidential information. Let's expose the truth, discuss the issues, and learn the facts. Cannabis Confidential, only on CannabisRadio.com. Time to plant some more conversational seeds. You're listening to The Grow Show with Kyle Cushman, only on CannabisRadio.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Now it's time for the final segment of the show that I like to call Ask Kyle. Every day I get questions from people around the world who have questions about their cultivation challenges, and I dedicate this part of the show to answering those questions. We got some great questions this week. So let's see, you know, before I start with these new questions, and since we have Adam Dunn here, master cultivator breeder, a few weeks ago, I did a show with Keith Straup, and we were talking about feminized seeds. And I have some reservations about feminized seeds. What's your opinion on the subject? Well, like I said earlier, you know, to me, it was a great testing thing. Like, I like to use tools sometimes for the wrong reasons, but that actually sometimes can make them make more sense. And so, for instance, like, like I was saying earlier, if I had testing stuff, if I put either like chibleric acid or colchicine or I'm using silver nitrate or silver thiosulfate, then I'm going to see which plants respond by reversing sex, and that will show me whether that they're strong genetics or not, you know? It's, it's a little mm-hmm. bit of the reverse, a reverse test. And, of course, you know, to me it's like it's a shortcut, and the only reason that shortcuts will work in this industry is if, you're, if you don't care, you know? And if you care, you don't do shortcuts. So that's part of the whole difference between a good breeder or a good grower and a bad grower, you know? Sure. Like, you shouldn't take shortcuts. You shouldn't be able to sleep at night if you think your plants are dry or need, need something. <laughs> you know what I mean? You should be woken up from the middle of the sleep and you should get that. Oh, totally relatable. I have a question but here. But I'm not a big fan. I'm not a big fan. I mean, I think it's great also for, for newbies, you know? And if you feel like you're a newbie, jump in there and grab some, you know? Do you think that there is an issue with breeding from feminized seeds? It depends on who did them in the first place. There's some feminized companies which I think are doing better than others there are some people are taking it a little further down the step it's also if they're selfing the plants or if they're turning them into a like if they're reversing a plant and then they're crossing it out with a normal plant it's not as bad as if you're just taking a plant and selfing it every time because when you're selfing it you're you're missing information you actually have the same information doubled up but you don't have so like whatever weaknesses now are exemplified and whatever strengths are now exemplified so so the plant might end up being super great for certain things, but it'll have very have no defenses now that it hasn't been coupled with something that actually could have helped it out in the first place. I mean, that's the great thing about breeding in general is if you, you take any kind of population and you, and you introduce a different thing to it and you get to follow the results, usually you find that crossing, you know, that's why F1s and things are so interesting because they, they create hybrid vigor, which is what we're all looking for as growers. We want that vigor. We don't want weak plants. You know, purebred. We want to improve of, the gene pool and not degrade the yeah. gene pool. Exactly, and you know, and, and animals are an easy way to look at it. Like we've destroyed some of the dog breeds out there. You know what I mean? By thinking we're doing good, and the dog suffers its entire life with breathing problems or hip problems or whatever because right. we want to keep it pure. And whereas if you get a mutt from the same dog, it, it's smarter, it's you know, it can jump higher, it lives longer, it does all these better things. But people just want that pure thing. So, you know, and, and that's why I do this show, Adam. It's to increase our our visibility so that people like us can keep hold of this industry and this this community, this culture of ours, it's really important. This is an interesting question I'd like to get your thoughts on too. What is, Stan T from, via email, wants to know what is the difference between autoflower and photoperiod seeds? Well, you know, the thing when I moved to Amsterdam, I, one of the first things that kind of like was really hot at the moment there was grow ruderala strains. And Sensi had a really good example when I worked for Sensi. They took the best plant they had, which was the Northern Lights number five, and crossed it with a straight ruderalis. So they ended up, and that was their, their ruderalis indica strain that they sold for 25 euros for, I think it was even like 20 seeds or something. So it was a very good, very good bargain. But in, in those seeds, you had literally the best and the worst of everything. You know what I mean? You had the early flowering ruderalis ones that would come out at, you know, they would finish off at six, seven weeks. 
and they wouldn't need any introduction of a photo period, whereas uh, regular seeds, you know, you need to drop through hours to 12 hours to induce flowering. And what you had with those is a complete range. You had some that were the Northern Light number 5, almost pure, and those would just have a regular photo period. And you had the pure Ruralis, which were very obvious Ruralis, and then you had a few in between. But the few in between were very hard to work with. And my opinion about autoflowers is if you don't care about yield, go for it. But if you have any desire of yielding any kind of actual numbers, stay away from autoflower because you can't stop them. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you're, you're back right. to the same problem we talked about earlier, which is the male that cannot stop itself. You know what I mean? Now you have females that can't stop themselves. That's even worse. Great description. I appreciate right. it. I have another question from the Grim Kiefer via email, and they ask, what's the best way to store seeds? Is it safe to keep mixed or gifted mystery seeds in around my better quality stuff? <laughs> That's really interesting. It's kind of a weird, is, weird question, but... Um, he's, he's, worried, I mean, he's worried about... Transfer goodness. of genetics via yes. touching or something? No, so, I mean, storage is pretty pretty basic. It's cool and dry uh, and dark is, is, is the best I can describe, you know, if, if you keep things in the fridge, I keep all my seeds in the fridge always. And that's your best cool, dry, dark place that's probably in your house. You also want to keep it very steady. Like, what's actually great, if you're going to keep seeds in a long-term storage and you have quite a few of them, is just to go buy yourself like a wine like a wine chiller, one of those fridges, because they'll never spike on you. You never have to worry right. about them freezing by mistake. 50-something degrees is way better than the temperature of your actual refrigerator. Exactly, because you're, every time you open your fridge, it does go up and down, up and down, up and down, and it is from extremes, you know what I mean? And the cold is, I mean, the plants can, be quite honest, we know these things can travel through space. I know that for a fact. I mean, that's how they got here, right? They had to get here somehow. I believe that the seeds are some of the most incredible things in the world when it comes to longevity. I've sprouted seeds that are over 20 years old without a problem. You might have to coax them a little bit, a little bit of sandpaper, <laughs> a little bit of work on them to soften them up. Some CO2 enriched water, like some just some seltzer water or something like that would help. Interesting. But for the most part, you know, when you sprout a 20-year-old seed, you know that thing was designed to sprout a year later. You can feel that those things are really, uh, in, they have a, an ability to last longer than we do, that's for sure. Well, listen, Adam, you've been really amazing, and I want to thank you again for being on the show today. But we are to come running... back sometime. Whenever, whenever you need me, I'll be here for you. Oh, thank you. I want to let everybody know if you want to submit your own questions, just go to our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash The Grow Show. You can tweet questions to at Can Radio using hashtag The Grow Show or send via direct message. We are out of time. I would like to thank our guests and producers for making the show possible. Adam, can you please tell the listeners how they can get a hold of you, a website or such? Yeah, sure. Well, we have an online store for Hoodland. It's called the uh... Hood Lab, it's spelled H O D L A B, hoodlabstore.com. That is our retail sales for clothing. With TH Seeds, unfortunately, it's a state by state. Unless you make it to Colorado, it's going to be a hard time. It's hard for me to get you guys any kind of genetics, but feel free to come through Colorado anytime. There's a bunch of different establishments there. And just keep an eye on at thseeds.com for other information. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Everybody, make sure to please check out my website, kylecushman.com, where you can find out where to follow me on social media, upcoming events I'll be attending, and subscribe to my newsletter. You can find new episodes of The Grow Show every Wednesday by going to cannabisradio.com or subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm your host, Kyle Cushman, and as always, stay lifted. The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast or redistribution without proper consent of CannabisRadio.com is prohibited.